today's lesson is about something called oxidation numbers and this is probably a brand new concept to you so let's start with the definition of what an oxidation number is so oxidation numbers are a basically an accounting system that chemists use to keep track of electrons in a chemical reaction eventually we will use these numbers to help us figure out where electrons are going and coming from when a chemical process is happening, for instance, who's losing electrons or who's gaining electrons. For now, however, our purpose is simply to assign oxidation numbers to either elements or a compound or polyatomic ions. And again, later, we will talk about how these oxidation numbers change. But today, our goal is simply to assign them. So there's a set of rules for determining oxidation numbers. So we're gonna go through those rules first and look at a couple of examples with each rule, and then we'll do some practice at the end. So the first rule is very, very easy. If you have a free element, so a pure element, the oxidation number is zero. So here are some examples of pure elements. Na, sodium, O2, which is the pure form of oxygen, cobalt, gold. For any of these, the oxidation number is zero. And I tend to write oxidation numbers up above the element, so we could put little zeros up there if we wanted to, okay? Now, it's also worth noting that if you had a free oxygen atom, not diatomic, it would still be zero. Or if you had ozone, which is O3, it's still zero. The main idea is that these are pure elements, whatever allotrope it might be, it's still zero. Same thing with carbon, whether it's carbon diamond, carbon graphite, carbon charcoal, it's zero. Okay, so that's the first rule. The second rule is if you have a monatomic ion, the oxidation number, that says oxidation state, I'm gonna try not to confuse things, this should be oxidation number. Um, they mean the same thing. The oxidation number for a monatomic ion is equal to its charge, the same thing. So if you have sodium the ion, maybe for instance you have sodium chloride. So that right there is sodium the ion, its oxidation number is plus one. Well, chloride is also a monatomic ion, so its oxidation number is minus one. So the oxidation number of each of these ions is the same thing as its charge. So sodium is plus one, oxide is minus two, Cobalt in this case is plus one. Gold in this case is plus three. So it's whatever the ion's charge is. Now it's really important that you understand the difference between these two sets of examples. The ones up here are free elements. They are not paired up with anything. They are just the atoms, so they are zero. The ones down here are in the ion form. Now normally you're not gonna see them just as individual ions. Normally, again, you would see them in a compound like NaCl, um, and then you would know that it's the ion, so its oxidation number is the same as its charge. All right, the next rule. This is probably the most important rule out of all of these. The algebraic sum of the oxidation numbers of all the atoms in a compound must be zero. So earlier I showed you this NaCl. Sodium had an oxidation number of plus one. Chloride had an oxidation number of minus one. You have one sodium, which has the plus one charge. You have one chloride, which has a minus one charge. So the sum of all the oxidation numbers adds up to zero. That applies to any compound. All the numbers have to add up to zero. If we look at calcium chloride, the same thing applies. Calcium has an oxidation number of plus two. Chloride has an oxidation number of minus one. Now you might look at that and think to yourself, well, plus two and minus one doesn't equal zero, so what are you talking about? Well, you have to remember that you have two chlorides in the compound, okay? CaCl2 is the formula. So calcium has a plus two charge and there's only one of them. Chloride has a minus one charge, but there are two of them. So really chloride is contributing minus two as its overall oxidation number. So you could think of it as minus two down here, or you could think of it as minus one, minus one. Either way, plus two, minus one, minus one, all adds up to zero. So in any given compound, all the oxidation numbers of all the atoms have to add up to zero. Similarly, the algebraic sum of all the oxidation numbers in a polyatomic ion must equal the charge of the ion. So 
for instance, in the hydroxide ion, which is OH minus one. The oxidation number of oxygen and the oxidation number of hydrogen have to equal minus one. So we haven't quite gotten to the rules yet to explain this, but let me tell you that oxygen is minus two in that case and hydrogen is minus one. So since we have one of each, uh, sorry, hydrogen is plus one. So since we have one of each, minus two and plus one equals negative one. So the sum of the oxidation numbers equals the charge on the ion. We'll look at more examples of that rule in a minute. The next rules I like to call the always rules. Okay, These help you sometimes figure out one element first and then you can figure out the rest. In a compound, the more electronegative element is always negative and it gets its usual negative charge. So when I say usual negative charge, I mean the number that you memorized to be its ion charge, okay? So for instance, if I gave you the compound HF, which of those is more electronegative, hydrogen or fluorine? It's fluorine, okay? So fluorine's oxidation number is the same as its usual negative charge, which is minus one. So fluorine's oxidation number is minus one. We can figure out hydrogen because we know hydrogen's number plus fluorine's number has to equal zero. So what does hydrogen have to be? It has to be plus one. So the oxidation numbers for hydrogen and fluorine are plus one minus one. So remembering that the more electronegative element always gets its usual negative charge is a useful always rule. Another always rule is that in compounds, hydrogen is usually plus one, okay? Um, it's so usually plus one that I call this an always rule. The one exception is if hydrogen is bonded to a metal, it would be negative, but that's very rare. Um, most of what you're gonna see in, AP, er, in pre-AP and even AP chemistry, hydrogen is gonna be plus one. So I'm gonna call that an always rule. Hydrogen is always plus one. And we saw that here, you know, with the fluoride. Another always rule, oxygen is usually minus two. Usually so often minus two that I again call this an always rule. So I say that oxygen is always minus two. The one exception is the peroxide ion. In that case, it is negative one. And the only other exception is if it's bonded to fluorine, oxygen would need to be positive, okay? To balance out the fact that fluorine is more electronegative and gets the minus one but oxygen and fluorine don't bond together very frequently. So if all that makes sense to you, great. If not, just tell yourself that oxygen is always minus two, call it an always rule, and let's move on. Two more always rules. If you have an alkali metal in a compound, it's always plus one. If you have an alkaline earth metal in a compound, it's always plus two. If you don't know those names yet, alkali metals are group one of the periodic table. So that's like sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, lithium, okay? Alkaline earth is group two of the periodic table. So that is beryllium, magnesium, calcium, etc. So group one is always a plus one charge. Group two is always a plus two charge. Now notice that I said that that's in a compound. If any of those metals were found by themselves, the oxidation number would be zero, but if they're in a compound, group ones are plus one, group twos are plus two. All right. Um, it is worth noting that sometimes oxidation numbers are the same as the numbers found on the periodic table, like the charges, but it's not always true, so it's just worth noting that you have to figure it out on your own sometimes. Sometimes they're not even whole numbers. We're not going to look at any examples of that, but it's, it's, again, worth noting. You might see some in the future that are not whole numbers. So we're going to do some practice together first. So let's take it one at a time. Hydrochloric acid, HCl. So I always like to try to find an always rule and start with that one. So hydrogen is my always rule here. Hydrogen is always plus one, so I'm going to put that answer over here. And if hydrogen is plus one, Chlorine needs to be something to where they both add up to zero. And since there's one of each, chlorine has to be minus one. So again, one hydrogen, one chlorine, plus one minus one equals zero. My next one is silver nitrate. Um, silver is a monatomic ion here, so it gets its normal charge, which is plus one. In nitrate, 
I need to figure out one of the elements first using my always rule. I know that oxygen is always minus two, so I'm gonna put that over here. Now nitrogen is not its usual ion number, okay? We need to figure this one out using some, what I call baby algebra. I need to remember that one silver and one nitrogen and three oxygens have to add up to zero. So I have one silver and it was plus one. I have one nitrogen, I don't know what it is, I'm gonna call it X. And I have three oxygens and each one is negative two. So my overall oxidation charge of oxygen is minus six and all of that has to add up to zero. So in class, I call this baby algebra, solve for x, and that's the number of nitrogen. It has to be plus five, okay? Now, if you look at your answers here, that does not all add up to zero. What I've put in the box here does not all add up to zero, but you have to remember that you have one silver, one nitrogen, and three oxygens. And when you take into account that you have three oxygens, three times the negative two, then it does all add up to zero. All right, my next example is iron oxide, okay? Specifically the type of iron, if I move that number back up, it's iron three oxide, okay? Um, figuring out the name of it, iron three oxide, actually helps us figure out the answer for the oxidation numbers. All I have here is two monatomic ions, okay? Iron three is an ion, it's monatomic, and oxide is a monatomic ion. So their oxidation numbers are the same as their charges. So iron is plus three, and oxygen is minus two. I also could have known that oxygen was minus two from the always rule. Oxygen is always minus two. Okay, again, if I put this in a box and look at my answer here, that does not add up to zero, plus three and minus two. But if I take into account that I have two irons and three oxygens, I end up with plus six for the iron and minus six for the oxygen, so it does add up to zero. My next one is hydrogen. Notice that it's just H2, it's the pure element, so what's the oxidation number of pure elements? It's zero. And finally, sulfate the ion, the sulfate ion. Oxygen is minus two, and I need to figure out what sulfur is, okay? Here's another example of doing baby algebra. I have a sulfur, and I don't know what its oxidation number is, so I'm gonna call it X. I know that oxygen is minus two, because that's an always rule, and I have four of them. So what's four negative twos? It's negative eight. And all of that has to add up to the charge on the ion, which is negative two, okay? So again, do baby algebra. Sulfur X, that's your oxidation number of sulfur. You get plus six, okay? So again, plus six for the sulfur, minus eight for all the oxygens equals negative two. So that's the basic idea of how you assign oxidation numbers. Next, the, here are some problems that you can try on your own. I'm gonna recommend that you pause your video right here and try these on your own. And then when you press play, I'll show you the answers. All right, so here's the answers, and check your work. If you have any questions over these, please bring your paper to your teacher, and your teacher will be able to help you out. That's it. This is a pretty short concept. I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment or ask your teacher. Thanks for watching.